Yo. Man. Not much. Just working, man. Yeah, yeah, you just got off. Yeah, well, I mean, I make my own schedule, so yeah. Yeah, just left, basically. <laughs> yeah, I honestly just, I just pulled over to a, uh, a quiet spot, and, and, and a legit quiet spot, not a buzzard spot. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, I mean, you never know, like, um, I mean, I'm at a Bank of America, you, you know, somebody could just come hassle me, uh, but I am a customer, I'll just be like, yeah, I'm just making a quick phone call, and I'm about to hit up the ATM. Well, you remember that time that I was a legit customer? Mm-hmm. You remember that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They hassled you, man, for, for, uh, well, I forgot what the, the reason they gave. Um, they said that that particular bank had been robbed previously. Um, I found out that that was not true for sure, for sure. Other banks around that area had been targeted, but that particular one had definitely not been. Mm. But that's what they use in order to create a Terry stop, I guess. Yeah, you know, and, and I... And I I don't agree with those type of tactics, you know what I mean? Like, uh, there's proper ways to approach things, and you can, you can, I mean, being in law enforcement yourself, like, you know, like, you can look somebody's information up by their plate and kind of get a, an idea of who you're dealing with. Sure, definitely. So, by all means, like, run the plate, and if there's, like something pops up then you know like expired license or something like that like yeah. check it out but if it's like if you run the plates and it comes up legit and it's just a guy sitting in a bank of america parking lot recording a podcast i mean leave him alone yeah yeah no doubt the, my my trouble was is that i was sitting there eating corn you know corn in a cup uh-huh and I got my belly full, so I got a little bit uh, drowsy, and I laid there listening, either listening to a podcast or something along those lines, and started to fall asleep, so I was there for like an hour, you know, Um, they closed at like 5, and it was 4.30, so when when the, whoever it was showed up there, I was like, oh, well, I was going to go in and do business, but they're closed and he's like no it's 4 30 they're not closed so he already thought that was weird and you know, <laughs> like i work you know i work in uh, north dallas he was like where in north dallas and then i gave a street that that i thought was in north dallas at the time because i had just you know just moved to that area and he was like oh that's south dallas so that you know those few things for sure, you know, I would if I was in the same position, I would be like, um, you know, time, manner, day, the the time is okay, the manner is questionable, and because he, there's a person with out of state tags sitting for a long time in the parking lot of a bank, so that's at least worth touching base with that person sure so no problem with that and i didn't have any problem being like i i'm totally not up to anything because i wasn't you know absolutely not i think i had just dropped ashley off at work heading back home and then i pulled over there to eat my corn and just kind of took a nap so that just kind of went in a weird direction but of course i was innocent and and they quickly found that out and it was no problem but i remember at that you know one little weird spot there i was like uh is uh is this a terry stop i remember telling you that and the guy was like i've never heard of that what is that (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah you know you know what it is pal he said i i know what a terry frisk is so i wish i i might even still have the i recorded it but I said, did, did 
the Terry Frisk is is in the same case, Terry versus Ohio. He was like, I've never heard of that. Never heard of that case. <laughs> I think we were playing games. But. They do, man. They always. Uh, it's funny because they're, we've met a bunch of great police officers. You are a former police officer, you know. Uh, of course, Jerry, we know, great guy. Um, I worked with a lot of them. Uh, fantastic, but there are some guys that like to use some maybe unethical tactics. What you know? Oh, yeah. And th- this is a good reason to that some guys are like, hey, I, just, I don't answer questions. Because if yep. you because if you would have said, hey, I'm sorry, I don't answer questions. Can I be on my way? I mean, he wouldn't have anything to go on. No, um, he, he, he might have still did a, um, uh, like I could think of a way to, to do a detention. If the, uh, I'm always thinking from other people's perspectives. So if I was standing there and there was a dude there in the, in the driver's seat, I could think of a way to make it a, a just a brief detention because the guys behind the driver's seat, and he's clearly like drowsy. Now, I I wouldn't say drowsy necessarily. I would just say he appeared to be um, he he appeared not to be in a completely sound state of mind, which is true. But it sounds way worse than it he is. He appeared sluggish. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I wanted to ask a few questions. He he. Um, you know, denied answering questions, so I, I didn't feel that people and property were in the area were safe yet, or I wasn't sure. So I wanted to continue this investigative detention until I could know for sure or not. And you only have twenty something minutes to do that because you can't be. I'm sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, you can be not sure for like days. So it can only be so long, but um, I, in that time period, anything could have happened. But I did answer questions then, and it worked out. Yeah, like, and, you know. and it should, and it, and it normally will, you know. Uh, I guess the guys wanted uh, to double check, you know what I mean? He didn't... Uh, he didn't violate your rights or anything like that. No. Um, and if you think they're only called somewhere when there's like trouble, nobody, nobody's calling them somewhere because they're going to throw them a party or something. You know what I mean? So that would be highly suspicious, right? Right. You're right. Like, hey, we're throwing a party. <laughs> oh, really? See, even that, that right there, they would show up with ready with a trigger finger. So, if you um, call time one and say, you know, we're throwing a party for police officers, come quick. I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be there, okay? But, <laughs> so, um, yeah, they're already dealing with nothing but trouble 90% of the time. Everybody's lying. Everybody's got a problem. Nobody likes them really anymore. So it's just like problem after problem after problem. So any little thing looks like, oh, you're going to be a problem. But Well, um, if I was a police officer, I wouldn't take offense to, hey, people don't like the police because some individuals have done horrible crap. Like the, the guy that was planting cocaine on people and arresting them, and they were getting cocaine charges. And like, the guy that killed uh, George Floyd. And isn't that isn't that guy uh, doing? Uh, I forgot what sentence he got. Didn't he get a a, a long prison prison sentence? I, I didn't he get life or something? Like I can't do it. I I don't know. I just know. I just remember they were talking about the case. It's funny. I, I said it was going to be quiet, and then a <laughs> an am, a damn fire truck drives by. There they come for you. Yeah. No. Uh. uh I, I know that many people argued uh, different side in that case, and there's a lot of speculation, you know, from the like the defense attorneys. weren't they trying to say it was a drug-related death? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They the defense is basically I, I like 
I, I think I can boil it down really fast and really uh, condensed. The defense is saying George Floyd is a chronic drug user with heart problems, and when he resisted police, it exasperated those conditions, you know, uh, synergistically, and he died as a result of his struggle with police. Uh, you know, on drugs, uh, heart problem, does something so the police have to interact and put hands with on him. That they did. He, he, at one point at the beginning, he resisted. Now he stopped, and that's that's when the problems start for them. But at the beginning, they had to initiate uh, a, an arrest or at least detention, and he kind of fought back a little bit. So the defense is saying in that struggle, his life began to wane, and then it ended shortly after. And you you see how that kind of explains how things played out from their perspective. The, um, The other side, the prosecution said he did use drugs, he did have a heart problem, and that didn't kill him the, the the guy killed him he was just on drugs and had a heart problem so um how do you tell the difference well first when just like we teach the kids how do you tell the difference between bullying and uh joking and playing you know how do you tell the difference between bullying and joking what would you say, Roger? I don't think that you've learned those those specific. Those are different techniques. Mm, uh, probably when you're making uh, some sort of joke that you know is upsetting the other person. You know what I mean? And then you you can see that they're visibly upset, and then you continue. Very. That's a very good, very good idea, and I think it's getting at the the root and probably saying the same thing but uh when when we teach the little kids because a lot of times they'll ask how do you tell the difference between bullying and joking because a lot of their friends will do something and say i'm just playing i'm just joking well if somebody does something and you don't like it they might be your friend or they might actually be a bully if you tell them stop doing that and they stop then they were joking or they took it seriously, what you said. But either way, when joking stops, then we're all good. It's, it's no problem. But when that joking continues, even though you told them to stop, then it's bullying. So, for example, a kid every day sees another kid and he, and he says, Hey, Baldy, and he, even though the kid has hair. I mean, it's just some bully crap, right? Hey, Baldy. And this goes on for day after day after day. And then eventually the kid said, but the kid that says, hey, Baldy, he plays with this kid at recess and like nothing is going on, like they're friends. But every time he sees them, hey, Baldy. And eventually the kid says, hey, listen, we play together real nice, but you call me Baldy and I don't like that would you stop and the guy says oh i'm sorry you know i i will i'm genu- genuinely just joking i'm playing with you and i didn't know that it hurt your feelings and then they stop so that's a friend you know that that's a uh, nice guy well you haven't uh, you haven't made me stop calling you mini cakes so <laughs> well there's also um a, a segment of people that I'm hesitant to, hesitant to say are less affected by these type of interactions. Bullying or not, it just at, at some point doesn't really matter. Like, of course, there are still scenarios where you're like, that guy um, is a bully. I wish I could shut his mouth for him. I can't get into that context, but 
bullies still exist that you um, have to deal with one way or the other in your life. So I know that if I told you that I didn't like that or it hurt my feelings or something like that, you would you would take it really seriously. You would be shocked, first of all. For sure, for sure. I, just, I try not to say anything like messed up you know it's kind of we we put a little light uh on each other but it's very friendly stuff yeah it's stuff that we either know we either talked about previously or joked about in a context that it um was clear that the other person wasn't offended and in that kind of case it's like me telling the buzzard he's annoying or whatever that was it a lot of people like even Ashley listening in was like is this recorded did you say that for real and I was like yeah Nick Nick isn't offended he self-proclaimed that he was annoying yeah he knows he's annoying and like Megan eat up out of the bugs over there (laughs) she, she asked the same thing. Was that recorded? <laughs> I told her, I was like, that, that's a big story in that, you know, those few ju- jujitsu academies over there. It's not just, I mean, a, a lot of people knows about that because I told a lot of people. Of course, I was covered in bug fights. <laughs> not that they were like, what, what's going on? <laughs> that was crazy. I remember how you, before you go to bed, you'd spray yourself down with... <laughs> It was, it was deep. It was like deep woods off just so you could get sleep from head to toe. Like you're going out hunting, like squirrel hunting dead in the middle of the summer. <laughs> the of the day. Yeah. Oh, That's my God. He, he clearly had bed bugs. Uh, he had bed bugs, and I got bit by a spider on the ankle. Do you remember that? <laughs> They worked in tandem. There was a, there was a team effort. They teamed up. No kidding, man. I was I was really suffering there, but for some reason they didn't mess with him. <laughs> I I don't know. I mean, maybe it was uh, maybe it was one of those situations where it was like uh, uh, only affected the couch. You know, it could have been. You know, that's why you don't pick up, like, uh, uh, I'm not sure where uh, Nick got the couch, but that's why you don't pick up couches from the side of the road. Like, you can pick up tables, you can pick up, like, bed frames, but nothing with any fabric on it. That's a good point. Yeah, that happens a lot in hotels as well. Right. People are, you know, in, out, in, out, and then it's so easy to, to drop off bed bugs there. Man, are they hard to get rid of, but that that's a whole other issue. Um... What were we uh, going to talk about? What was our topics? Was it that knucklehead on the thing today? Because he, de- he definitely didn't respond back after uh, asking if, if he was going to provide anything else other than... He hasn't, done any, he hasn't done anything worth talking about. Like, that's why I was like... That's why I was like, hey, uh, where are your instructional videos? Because he was claiming he was such a badass... I was like, yeah, we're going to check out your instructional videos. And he's like, oh, I'm not a coach. I'm a competitor. I'm like, oh, yeah, what what uh, major tournaments have you entered? And he's like, I forgot what he said. Like, he basically was full of it. He, you know, he, he said he did some, like, what was it? IB, JJF <laughs> tournament or something. Yeah, IBJJF. That's, that's the blue one, right? Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, which, I forget, I forget what, uh, it's just, that's, that's the, you know, the major, like, the, most of the gi guys, you know, do that. That's, like, the major gi, uh, tournaments. Oh, AGF. IBJJF, yeah. Yeah, but there's another one that, didn't he say AGF as well? Or? No, I don't think he did. I think he said, oh, okay, he's like, uh, a lot of IBJJF tourneys. What about you? You Gracie noobs aren't known for competing, is what he said. Either way, uh, again, we go back to bragging on competition. Yeah. So, Nobody gives a shit. Like, no. Like, come, come see me uh, in person, and I will slap you up. That 
oh, that is exactly what would happen. But it would have to play out in such a way that that person would have the heart and courage to go fight. And that's not the kind of person that talks crap like that. No. So that person is not even leaving comments. And if they are, then they're, you know, like supportive and, um, you know, good, good detail right there. Because what, for what do you benefit to try to uh, hurt, like, judge somebody's game or their technique or their, um, anything to do with what they're doing when you don't have a clue what this is I, I suppose that you can read the title the description and then like the page description and then see like oh these are uh gracie jujitsu people and all this shit like we believe that's what they think dude and, i think it's the same guy from last time like on an alt account he's just He's just butthurt, like, like as soon as, like, he, like, kind of said, come meet me at an open mat, and then, oh, never mind, sign up for the tournament, uh, like, he immediately changed his, um, he, like, changed the name on his account, like, he totally, like, withdrew, you know, he was, he was just not about, like, getting in a real fight, because... Because he doesn't know, like, he has, he has no idea, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of the fear of the unknown. He's probably not wanting to put himself out there and, and possibly get fucked up. Well, you know, you know why he switched it from open mat to sign up for the tournament? What, what do you think? Um, I mean, there's a, a big chance of getting hurt. There's, there's a, a referee, like, you could... You know, I mean, you could heel hook him and blow his knee out. Right. You know? The main thing is, Roger, the main thing is that the open mat could could turn into a fight. It could. And the, the sport role, the chances of it turning into a fight is maybe 1%, but it, as soon as it, if it did, it would be broke up immediately. So... He wanted the rules. He wanted the safety net. He wanted the come to my island and I'm going to be here tomorrow. He wants 10 of his friends right there, you know, in case he's like, oh, maybe he, the jiu-jitsu robot might, might be here if he, he tries wanted, anything. That's the thing is that at the open mat, there's way more what ifs and unknowns, especially as a... You get it like somebody that knows their sport guy, but wants to be uh, like a hoist type person. So they act tough and they talk crap, and then they want to prove it. Like they want to pull their card and say, "Let us go to a tournament, Karate Kid style." Yeah, it's super it's, lame. Yeah, it's weak because we didn't claim. I never have claimed once to be even a good sport jiu-jitsu person. I'm average. I mean, I'm a pretty average. I was average blue belt, average purple belt for sure. Average blue, uh, brown belt, although I believe better because of Scott Phillips. Certainly better than I would have been as a average brown belt. I'm probably more advanced because of him but only because of him so but not it's not like i would go to um naga or i don't even know the tournaments i know agf because you did it right uh yeah because it was the uh the least competition i was trying to give myself an ego boost right <laughs> yeah <laughs> there was only like one guy in your yeah, that's that's it. If there was a bunch of guys in my division, I wouldn't sign up. But if there was only one guy in my division, or even better yet, zero, then I would sign up. Yeah, then you might end up rolling with, like, some 110-pound dude. And <laughs> having to act like you're really giving it to him. Now, no offense, Nick Cooley. <laughs> but that is what happened. But no. It's no. funny. I, I had the chance to uh, do a match with the black belt, but my... Uh, 
a guy a, pre, a guy that I competed against who was an, actually a really nice guy. Um, so I, I definitely uh, would consider him a friend. He stepped up because he was ready to go. Like I didn't even bring any uh, like a rash guard or anything. I was just gonna fight him with like basketball shorts on. Where? Uh, it was at a really small tournament. I forgot what the name of it was. Maybe Grappling Industries. I'm not sure, but this older black belt needed a match and they were just like hey anybody want anybody want to take this match and he stepped up and he ended up beating the guy on points and the dude was like so pissed but he was like really out of shape like i don't know it was definitely suspect because i mean the this it were you know the uh, the guy that I'm talking about, the blue belt, he's, you know, early 20s at the time, uh, you know, competes a lot, you know, and he was just, the black belt was not very effective. Like, he didn't get subbed, there was no danger of a sub, but he got, you know, I think he got taken down and then uh, was kind of stuck on the bottom for a while, and that just did not seem right. Really? And he had some other people competing up there, but they... they I don't know how everyone did, but I remember one student, like, lost a match, and he could have gotten one more match to get a bronze, but they were just like, F it, and they just left. So they weren't even good sports. That, that's very, very strange. Who was it? Do you, do you... I don't know. I wish I would have got the name, because that guy, like, seemed, like, super suspect. I, Jerry even mentioned it. Uh, he's like, he, he was kind of giving the guy the benefit of the doubt, it seemed like, and he's like, yeah, that's why you don't compete if you're out of shape, because the guy looked like he was super out of shape. I mean, if you're out of shape, or even if you're a good, like, I mean, me or you or I, if we're completely out of shape, then if we went into a, into a tournament with people that are really getting into great shape, and going like it they're really trying to win and then we just show up like having just drank a coke and and ate like a a a dang ice cream sundae or something then they're if they're knowledgeable maybe even if they're not knowledgeable like well knowledgeable let me qualify that if they're like blue belt strike two, three, something like that, then we might be in a little bit of trouble. So, especially if it's a bigger guy that's strong, that's two, three strike blue belt is going to try to murder you and take your life from you. And it's a sport competition. So what choice do you have but to use the the technique to try to get a sweep, wind up on top, you know, like make as many points as possible on your way to submission. Because if you if we show up completely out of shape and just defend, then we're we're gonna be defending the whole time and also getting tired the whole time. Our defense is kinda hampered by the fact that we're out of shape. Our uh, belly is like digestion is not on the level that it needs to be for us to breathe like deep breaths and stay in control of our body. Not to say that we wouldn't defeat that person 10 times out of 10 if we had like a solid amount of time to do it. But in those fast matches where they can go, 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 and not feel like crap because they eat junk and haven't gotten in shape, then chances are are that they're going to get too hot and heavy for us to catch up to. So we might need like double that time or triple that time to be able to catch that person where otherwise we would be able to do it pretty quickly. So... Yeah, you just not you didn't get the chance in that short match. I want to say it was like a fairly short match. Yeah, yeah. And he, I think the the the, the blue belt kid, he won uh, like two to zero on points. You know, one thing that I found interesting is sometimes at those tournaments, you see like some people that are 
going to be world famous people. Like, I saw Robert, is it Robert Jimenez or something like that? Mm hmm. He was 16, I believe he was, or he was still 15 wearing the green belt and tapped out that black belt. Do you remember that? Uh, what tournament was that? It was. Was that the one Nick entered? Was it Europa? I think it was. I think so. And the guy got really uh, upset about that. Yeah, there was a whole thing because I think he caught him in a footlock, right? I don't recall the move. I think that it was a footlock and there was something about a rule like he couldn't use footlocks on him because he wasn't uh, to the belt level or is there are, are you Are you sure it wasn't that situation where the guy just stood up and there was no standing submissions, but he had clearly had a choke in, and then the guy just stood up with him on his back, and then he tapped because the guy was squeezing his neck. Are you sure that wasn't the one? It might be. I do remember him standing up. Yeah, the guy, the kid was on his back, and uh, I, I. But this might be the might. This might be a different match. The one, the one I remember. The only controversial thing I remember at Europa was like the blue belt had the black belt's back and I believe he had a body lock and then the black belt just kind of stood up with him on his back like a backpack and then he was kind of like you can't submit me now you know (laughs) and then the the guy you know he kind of like tapped but he's like this is a this is a bullshit tap because I know you can't submit me kind of had this look in his face like what are you doing you're supposed to let go now yeah and then the ref was like uh, you know, okay, he, t- he tapped you out, you lose. And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? No standing submissions. That's right. And he's like, uh, you, he had the submission on the ground, and you just stood up. That doesn't apply here. Exactly. That's what it was. That is exactly what it was. Because I remember feeling like the guy was, was like completely spitting in the face of the spirit of jujitsu. Yes. Like, you call me fair and square, but I'm going to do something to use the rules to make you let it go. That's, that's weak. Yeah, total garbage. You lost, that's what it is. Even if they restarted and all that, you lost. So, I saw but, him. Yeah, that's why, uh, you know, tournaments are tournaments and fights are fights. Like, we, in the real world, you know, you get choked to death. If you, if you choose to, and, and by the way, even if we're out of shape and uh, eating like crap, if that was the case right now, to the nth degree, if we got into a fight with an everyday person, even if they're bigger, stronger, more athletic, it would be so quick and effortless that it wouldn't play a role. So, but, but in a tournament, the person is knowledgeable enough and trained for that specific event enough that it would play a role and we wouldn't have those self-defense techniques to fall back on. Um, and we would just have to do our best jiu-jitsu that we can do as hard as we can do it and while feeling like crap. But, but, a, but a real fight would, wouldn't be long enough is what I'm saying for us to feel like crap. If they were able to push it out that far, then we would just take, I mean, if they're pushing it seven, eight, nine minutes and nobody's jumped in and we're just still fighting and I'm starting to feel like tired, then I'm just going to stay in that position and defend until the cows come home. So if it comes to the point where it's like life or death, you're either going to win or lose, if that's the way you want to define it, then you should just defend, exhaust that person until they pretty much die on top of you and then go. So regardless, that's what Gracie Jiu-Jitsu does is give us a way to win regardless our belt rank plays less of a role because we're going to do the same thing Roger is that I will that 
a person that just got their combatives built, that just got their belt from Pedro Sauer, they're all going to do the same thing. The plan's always the same, but, you know, maybe if we're more experienced, we have more conviction that it's going to work. That's the only difference. Yeah, your conviction, your familiarity with the, especially if you're doing fight techniques, those spots. So that part changes your your, um, belief that you're going to win. Although, I believe more probably that fight that I lost as like a 16, 17 year old, I believed more then. Like I know jujitsu, all that there is. And I had never learned the first thing. Well, that's just wild. Right? Just from watching those UFCs, I made it in my mind that what jujitsu is, is taking them to the ground and then you know, using the guard to uh, defend, like I had it in my mind, but then making it play out is like impossible if you don't know how to do it. Yeah, you missed a bunch of the details, you know, like you can't, uh, you can't watch a movie in French and then speak French. Yeah, especially and comprehend, like question, answer, question, answer. No, you don't know it. And um, one of the things I was, like, we were listening to one of our podcasts that we haven't published yet on the way on trip today. And Blake asked me about um, the part in one of those episodes where I said Scott Phillips took me from somebody that showed up as a purple belt, advanced knowledge level, but only half of a book. And he wrote the rest of the book. And Blake said, oh, that sounds like that. Sounds like that would be a fun mission. And I said, it would be a fun mission, but let me rephrase. What he did was, he said, I said, Blake, I am as good as I am right now at jujitsu. I want you to make me better. Go. So he was like, oh, you can't even imagine what to do right. if, you don't, if you don't know until you're put in that spot where it's like, okay, and go. You well, think, you know. especially, you know, Blake, from Blake's point of view, he's like, oh, wait, you're my coach. <laughs> yeah, and yes, yes. So how am I going to teach you something? But the truth is that Blake could teach me everything that he ever learned in his perspective. That's what I learned from. What do you think? What did you think when you did that? What did you think when you tried that? Um, Why didn't you defend this way? Or why did you defend that way? What worked for you? What didn't? Because you're going to, you're going to learn from that perspective and learn what is Where is his mind at right now? Is it like this kid is bigger than me and he's stronger than me and he always uses strength against me? Well, that's one of the things that they think after they reach a proficiency at jujitsu so that when a bigger person beats them, that they can say, oh, he's not better, he's bigger, and then he uses jujitsu and his size, and that's the only reason that he wins. And that's kind of where Blake was, maybe, uh, maybe still is, I would say, because he he feels that that he is effective. So if that effectiveness is absent or it feels like it's not there, and and the person's much bigger, then it there's a connection uh, it's much he's much bigger so he's using strength to beat me well i know one specific case of a kid that like thinks that about and the kid is much bigger much stronger and also 
higher level technique. He's been doing it longer. And he's good. So, and, and his belt is higher. So it's not like, you know, like two kids in the same belt and saying, no, that one's better. No, he's a higher belt by far, like two belts higher. And um, he's bigger and, of course, bigger and stronger. But I've, I've watched them roll like 20 times and never seen any strength. He's he's big. He's a big boy, so you can't get away from your size. You just are what you are. So, um, and Blake is squirmy and, like, he can escape. So, of course, he's going to use his bear-like qualities. If he has bear-like qualities, then he's going to use bear-like qualities with jujitsu, And that's a, t- that's a tough fight, just like me, you from me. That's just a tough fight. It's not the size. The size plays a role because it can't. It cannot play. Not, it cannot not play a role. But if the technique was better then it would win. So, and I know that. He doesn't know that for sure yet. He is still in the in the belief that if your technique is very good, that the person is a lot, like, way bigger, and they know jiu-jitsu some, then they're going to win every time. But, a, but he uh, does know that if we're the same size and I have jiu-jitsu... Jiu-Jitsu is going to win every time. He believes he will win every time. I, I would say the only time that he, I mean, it's this specific, like, um, this event, the person is much bigger. And, and I'm talking about, like, this this guy is, like, six foot, maybe, like, 225 pounds like much bigger almost grown man I mean that is grown man that's grown man size yep so that that has to play a role but if the technique was if if Blake was a purple belt then that guy he wouldn't think in his mind I'm just not going to have a chance against this bigger guy he would think I'm, if, if this is that kind of day, he would think, you're going to be on my wall of kills, or whatever you think, you know, like, you're one of my victims, check, I'll just check you off the list. Well, that's a hardcore way to think about it, because you're building your self off of that person's loss. But you don't have to go through with that. You can then say, but... I'm going to, I'm going to defend or I'm going to attack a little bit and then survive a little bit. And I'm going to this or that. But you, the main point is you wouldn't look at that person and think I'm going to get killed. You would look at them, if anything, and say, I could kill you, but let's just roll. You're not going to tell them that, but you, you kind of like an internal dialogue. Yeah. Because you got to have fun with it sometimes. You don't want to be, like, you don't want to be, like, going 100% each time. Like, sometimes it's fun to play around, and that's what, like, some of these guys, I guess, I guess these guys on the internet, they, they don't realize that we don't mind, like, putting out some videos where we're, we're not 100%. Like, they, they can't fathom like oh why wouldn't i just put out my best stuff my best example no i want to put i want to put my victories and my losses we want people to see the truth this is what we said from the get-go i want you to see the truth i want you to hear the truth and if you're if it's just a full cornucopia of truthfulness that this is what it is and you're not going to be able to say you only show, you know, your wins. That's what the Gracies do. They they get, they copyright their losses so you can't even find them. So it's only the wins. It's only the good stuff. And we, we're not going to talk about the bad stuff. But I'd like to, 
if I if I am if I am um, comfortable rolling with somebody and then going like fifty percent, and at some point they end up tapping me, and comfortable just saying nice, and we slap and go again, and and yeah, who cares? You know what I mean? Yes, I'm comfortable with that. Then I genuinely don't care if the people that were watching just saw, oh, that purple belt or brown belt just got tapped by a lower belt. They suck. <laughs> oh, it, it, that's what, I mean. Who cares, man? Like, we're just going to go and do our thing, and, and, like, we know the truth, and it doesn't matter. Like, like it, it doesn't hurt to get tapped. It really doesn't. Like, uh, and I, sometimes I'm surprised, like, because honestly, it's either jujitsu is effective or jujitsu is effective. It's like, oh shoot, this guy has effective technique and he he was sharp. Yeah, non jujitsu, like anti jujitsu, never. I'll I'll venture to say, never can defeat actual Gracie jujitsu. Anti Gracie jujitsu would be what. Anti Gracie Jiu Jitsu would be going full on Fedor, like going crazy attacking. Not to that skill level, of course. Nobody else is at his skill level, you know, or was. But anti, if it's sport Jiu Jitsu, anti Jiu Jitsu is just to hold him down and don't move, right? Right. But if, it's, if it's a fight, holding them down and don't move is like a, a, a energy efficient um, survival type situation so they're doing a pretty dang good job if they are able to hold us down and just keep us there for good in a real fight so uh, but there's a lot of attacks that exist in the you know valley judo guard or the self-defense guard that are not capable, you're not um, allowed to do in sport jiu-jitsu. Like, you can end up getting your, like the story I said the other day, you can end up getting your kidneys so battered that you pee your, part of your kidney fragments out, pee in blood, and just bad stuff happens when you hang out in the guard of a person that knows how to attack and stay safe at the same time. So. Well, that's why they changed the rules, and you can't do that in MMA. Mm-hmm. It doesn't take a whole lot, and nobody has respect for those, like heels to the kidney from the guard. You don't see that. You saw that from Hoist. You saw that from Hickson in those fights where he would end up in the bottom, on the bottom, and. Um, Car- Carlos, uh, not Carlos, um, Carlson, the other fighter. Like, there's a few of them that were fighters that were the champions, you know. Uh, Elio, Carlson, <coughs> Higgs on Excuse me. That's okay. <coughs> ah, right in the middle of your... <coughs> Excuse me. Woo. The the fun of podcasting. Yeah. That's what happened. You 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 tried to snort a full nose of uh dirt, right? You just got tired and you're like, Well let me see what happens if I just snort some dirt. It was dust. Uh, my my dashboard's a little dusty, so I just oh. did a line of dust. That does happen sometimes. It hits our our human anatomy is like nuts but your body doesn't know it's like what is that what is that <laughs> you, <laughs> you know what's funny you know what's funny my uh my brother uh we used to go when we were teenagers we used to go to, to denny's or ihop or somewhere and we would do different things like like we would say uh uh can we get uh, well, maybe there's four of us can we get four syrups and then we do them like shots and then we next time the waiter Wait, waitress or waiter come around can we get another uh round of syrups <laughs> oh and and then micah 
my brother, he started, he started doing, uh, he did, I don't know why we thought of this, but we're like, hey, uh, snort a line of sugar. It'd be funny. <laughs> and so he snorted a line of sugar. I don't know why. We were just idiots, you know, and, and we would go shoot pool, like, all, almost all day into the night, and then when the pool hall closed, we would go uh, to Denny's or, or some, one of those breakfast restaurant places. I bet y'all would tear, tear them up, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we could You're, put away some, some pancakes, some grand slams. You and, you and your big little brother. But, man, I was skinny back then, man. It was crazy. Like, I was a 165, same height, and I could eat whatever I wanted. How, what time period was this? Oh, this is, uh, you know, 20 years ago. So, so. you're just young, early 20s? Or early, uh, teenage, uh, late, teenage years. Late yeah, late teens. Uh, yeah, so we're just running around, like, because I think, because uh, I had a driver's license, and my brother, he would just drive without a license, and, and uh <laughs> Yeah, we would just, uh, if you got pulled over, you'd always, like, say, oh, I forgot my license, and he would give them my my information. Yeah, you, I mean, was he also kind of thin back then, or he's built like it then? He's one of those, kind of one of those um, rhinoceros guys, pretty much, now. Yeah, he's, he's like, very muscly, but uh, he used to be strong, but very much slimmer. You know what I mean? Maybe not as slim as me, but uh, whenever he was a teenager, he because we would work outdoors, he was he was he was slim, but he was strong always. He would he would uh, like arm wrestle everybody. He would he would he would try to arm wrestle like our all the the guys in our family, like our uncles and stuff, like all the cousins. You know what I mean? Like once he got to, you know, once he was 18, like he was the strongest in the family easily. Always everyone funny. included. I, I could I know I know for a fact I can I can see he's got one of those hands like his hands are there's like there's like big human hands right you you have big human hands and then there's a size of hand that's like it looks like that must be a glove or a fake hand or that's not real he's got one of those hands gigantic double fist of hand that is. If you shake it, of course I have, but at one time I shook it in the position that you would arm wrestle. So I felt like my hand just got it enveloped, just swallowed up by that big tar- uh, tarantula of a hand. Yeah, he's got strong wrists, you know, strong uh, uh, fingers. Like he's he works with his hands. Like he's because I remember you you taught him that uh, uh, collar choke and then. You had to you had to defend it at all costs because he would immediately go for it and, and squeeze with all of his might. Oh yeah. So I you know once you taught him that one, I had to immediately defend it and he and he couldn't really go to anything else because he hadn't learned any of the alternatives. Yeah, basically a, a, a wrestler type situation where you're still kind of being controlled a little bit and uh can't do what you want to and there is a risk like if he grabbed you even even kind of one tenth of an arm lock and just started to to bend your arm you, you'd have to defend it like 100 percent. that's yeah. what type of strong that he is yeah I, I, I wish i was in the same city as him i we i wish when i was in the same city i was adamant about him training like i talked to him about it but he's always like so busy with work and now his health is deteriorating. How so? I mean, I think it's a combination of like, uh, I don't know exactly what he's eating. He, I think he started to eat clean lately, but he's got high blood pressure. He might have diabetes. Like, Gosh. you know, maybe, you know, I, I mean, I think it comes down to the sugar, you know, and that's been, you know, something I've struggled with is, is staying away from the, the sugar. Does but, he eat a lot of sugar? Uh, I believe he did. I think he's eating clean now. Uh, but he stopped smoking. He what? He smoked for you know, he smoked cigarettes for you know, since we were teenagers. You know. Gosh. 
so you know he's in his mid 30s now so it's it's catching up with him you know he doesn't have the lung capacity so i mean if you smoke for 20 years like it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna get you yeah it's gonna build up and it's gonna have an effect you're not getting out of that completely free period it's not gonna but i i wanted to uh if he was in better, maybe if he gets in, you know, like things turn around and gets in good shape and, uh, you know, 100% again, I want to be able to arm wrestle him. I want to see what would happen with that. I've well, told you that before. Well, he's still got a lot of strength. He, uh, he, uh, he could definitely take you up on it. It just, uh, <laughs> whenever he rolls, he gets winded because, um, yeah, and and I'm more effective at like tiring out, you know, uh, people. So, uh, at, I remember like I remember still as like a a white belt and early blue belt. Like he was still able to catch me a couple times. I think we rolled like four times at that point, mm-hmm. and two of the times he caught me. Wow. So he's just he was just that strong, and I think we rolled maybe once or twice after that at like the late you know late blue belt purple belt and as strong as he is there's not a lot my my defenses are just to a point where you're gonna it's gonna require more than strength to i mean yeah it's just gonna require more more than strength to get past those at this point yeah the the strength is if your technique is good enough you feel that strength and you feel your body wants to do like the techniques, but it does little modifications. So it's just like the te- the um, weight and strength and all that of the person. It's there, but your jujitsu is there and responding to it so effectively that it just feels like every other person. Really, it's like it's pretty amazing. It was crazy the last time, maybe not the last time he rolled, but the second to last time he rolled, he came over and we rolled, and he he exerted himself so much that he busted a blood vessel in his eyeball. Holy moly. Like, he, because he absolutely, I mean, he's, he, he's strong and he wants to, he's competitive, so he wants to, um, he wants he wants to get past your legs and and. and grab your gi and choke you right like he he knows how fun it is and and he's using the strength but when you have those little tricks to keep them uh from passing your guard and tire them out like it's super effective it doesn't matter like maybe i'm curious i wish i i wish we could go back in time and i could uh roll with him at like early 20s yeah that would have been something that would be something I know one thing that y'all are di- are humans that would you're not going to be victimized like by bullies nearly as much <clears throat> as probably 99% of the population because it would appear even from the get go when you first showed up at Jiu Jitsu that you already appeared confident and big and strong and athletic and aggressive and all of those things uh good uh, attitude so that's a pretty effective fighter already coming in the door so um yeah i bet you and him y'all probably went back and forth a lot growing up right i said before that he would be your best training partner ever and if you had rolled with him a bunch or like wrestled around fought with him a bunch growing up that that would just make y'all better than ever did y'all do that a lot well it's funny because i used to uh get mad at him uh for really no reason probably just stealing attention from my mother and uh because he was a sweet kid and you know he would follow me around like my sidekick but i would i would beat him up all the time i'd hit him with toys and stuff like that and uh, but we got to a certain point where he was once he was bigger and stronger than me 
the tables were turned. So anytime we got in a fight, like, I don't know, but he's such a nice guy. Like, even, okay, even if he won, when he won the fight, when he started to win the fights with me, because I didn't know how to fight. He didn't know how to fight, but he was just so much stronger. Yeah. Uh, he would basically get me pinned. I don't, I don't even think he slapped me around much. I don't feel like I took much damage. Like, he just did the minimum he had to do to, like, do you give up? Yeah. And then I'd be like, you know, I'd cuss him out or something. And then, you know, he would be like, well, we're just going to sit here until you were, you know, calm. And then... Yeah, that does seem like him. Yeah, he just, he's like a, he's a super sweet guy. And, uh, you know, even when... I'm being a total asshole. Uh, really, just showed me a lot of grace, you know. But uh, at the time, like when I was a teenager, I was just a, I don't know, really just a complete asshole. That's crazy. That that's crazy. I remember you telling me that when you when you came, um, I'm gonna, you know, use careful words, or you can edit it out. That when you first started doing classes with me, that you said like one of your main concerns or I asked you your biggest concern with your, like, behavior, basically, as strange as that sounds, that you were like, that you have a bad temper, that you can't control your temper. Do you remember telling me that? Oh, yeah, I was, uh, I would just get mad, uh, you know, basically, like, just driving, you know, uh, for, <laughs> for some reason, like, I, I think it's, uh, because you're, you know, I've heard I've heard people describe it as like you're in a heightened state because you're driving fast, and when people like drive uh, crappy, it gets us all like wound up. And I didn't have any uh, release for that, so when people would drive crazy or like almost cause an accident, like I would yell yell at them and cuss them out. And a couple times, you know, when guys cuss other guys out, sometimes guys are gonna like, you know. Uh, Nothing ever came of it, but maybe just some shouting matches with different different dudes, road rage situations. Yeah, I remember. But and, uh, uh, yeah, but not after, but after jujitsu, like I didn't give a crap. Like you could flip me off, and uh, I would just be like, you know, it was right after a training session. If you flip me off or cut me off, I don't care. Like I'm, just, I just, I left it, it all in the training room. Yeah, it's zero. It zero percent matters, and it it's if you're with somebody that is in a regular mindset just like regular human they cannot imagine why you would let them get away with that or why you're not mad i've heard so much of that like what are you why are you not as furious as i am and i want to say jujitsu has made my insides almost just like neutral that it's nothing's too bad nothing's too good it's just everything is okay all the time and you know even when it's not so okay it's okay to talk about it and so it doesn't go too far down doesn't go too far up that you can just live in this zone of like peace and that's the state that you get to put you in even in a fight or a role or something like that it's hard to believe sometimes that when we get ready to roll, literally when you slap, bump, roll, I bet you never felt your heart beat faster than if we had been sitting down on those bleachers talking, right? It's a common event to roll and um, do stuff like that. Maybe at a competition, you get a little bit, you feel a little bit of adrenaline, a little bit of a, rush and I got a win type deal briefly but training and rolling around and doing drills and all that it's you forget that people are uncomfortable with like even just falling sitting to their butt you know break falling that's that right there is enough to take a, a lot of people out of jujitsu well, so remember that lady who like didn't even uh, she came to jiu-jitsu and she didn't even want to she didn't even like the proximity she's like oh shoot like this is giving me like uh, trauma flashbacks are you talking about the one that I, that we had for some reason we were doing mount drills 
I don't Bring recall it. the move, but I just remember you talked to her because she was like, "Okay, this is this is not cool. Like, I I do not like being this cl- close to another human being. This feels like claustrophobic." And you kind of had to like give her like a, I think you like gave her like some sort of pep talk or reassured her some way. If it's the same one that I'm thinking about, is this one? I don't know why we were doing mountain drills. I, the only thing that I can think of is that the lady, the girl, would have had to ask me specifically, can you show me what to do if this or that? And then I'm like, are you sure? And she's like, yeah. Because otherwise I wouldn't have mounted somebody that said they had been a victim or something bad had happened to them in some kind of a an attack or something along those lines well i think it i think it started out with like a question maybe and then um at some point during like the demonstration um it feels uncomfortable like like many positions in jiu-jitsu are and it must have brought back something but it it, there was no forewarning um i remember that it kind of like surprised you and you're like okay let's take this to a different approach um, but it ended up having a happy ending. I remember, I remember, um, you sh- still showing her like some sort of alternative and you get, you kind of gave her like a little bit of like verbal coaching as well, you know? Yeah. No, I remember it was the, we were doing the mount, talking about whatever it was. I can't, I genuinely can't remember, but I was mounted and she was on the bottom and she went so crazy like full on felt like somebody trying to to um get me off of them but like for real like somebody has felt that you're gonna kill them or something she was going crazy so you know for two or three go crazies jujitsu is still there i'm not and i and i i don't know at this time that it's like she's kind of freaking out so the jujitsu is in place to the degree that she can't get me off of her so that freaked her out more and once i looked i could see her eyes were like big i was like oh and then i just let her, you know just she rolled me off so then I was like, oh, good, good, good. Hey, tell me what's going on. What's, what are you thinking? And then she got into it, right? She was just like, <gasps> she was very, I don't know if you remember from the same perspective I did, because I went and talked to her for like a solid amount of time. Right, right. Because uh, so, he wanted her to have a good experience and come back, obviously. And, and she was obviously like highly distressed. I remember you just baited. You basically gave me just the Cliff Notes version, so this this is actually more detail than I received at the time. So here's what happened. I told her that most people when they come to jiu-jitsu are so unfamiliar with closeness in this kind of way, uncomfortable closeness, you know, non-romantic or familial or... Um, genetic, you know, s- something along these lines of friends. When when we're close to strangers like this, it's already uh, not the norm. And when those strangers are doing something to, in our brain, hurt us or hold us down or something like that, that's so out of, you know, that's out of the ordinary to a gigantic degree. It never happens for most people. So this is like a completely crazy experience. Now, for, for most people, it's that. Imagine somebody that has been held down, but actually been victimized. And they have that in their mind. And then they go do that thing that is already uncomfortable and out of the norm. That triggers the victimization again so this is kind of some of the stuff that I was telling her that you know I was was, if I had been aware the degree that 
this had affected you, we wouldn't have did drills, period, with with contact like that, with contact. We wouldn't have did anything like that where we would have been face to face, where we where it would have been weight on belly or weight on chest where we would have created some kind of panic. I would have never did any of that stuff. Um, that would, it's totally unnecessary. And I didn't know beforehand, or I would have never done that method. But once she told me all that, what happened, and why she freaked out like that, then I was like, well, that's good. That's, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. You know, being being cautious of being in a position because you know for a fact the danger of it and trying to get that person off of you like your life depends on it because you know that your life depends on it. So you're already a leg up. You're already ahead of everybody else in this room right now because you know what they think is true. You know that it's true. So... I'm going to use a partner. I'm going to, if, if I use her, then I'm going to have her on her side and maybe it be in like modified mount so that if she pushes, that she feels escape. If she moves, then she moves freely. There's no heavy, you know, no weight, no um, sense of, uh, uh, what was that? I said panic. Jiu-Jitsu to her has to be almost an inch of space between us. She can't reference being uh, panicked in any way. That can't you can't learn and be panicked at the same time. Right. So, of course, I told her all this that we're gonna we're gonna work on her removing panic and work on her removing her necessity to resist because that resistance would be the quickest way that they're able to carry out their assault or their whatever it is that they're doing you fully fully resisting is helping them to do it yeah so. especially if you're smaller and you know you this there's a your attacker is your attacker is stronger bigger you know if you're smaller weaker you're, you going crazy is not going to have the, it's not going to help you escape. It's just going to help tire you out. Yeah. And that's why we plan always for the person to be bigger, stronger, more athletic. And if that's the case, then we should make them like gorilla strong and us like, um, you can't always use the same thing ever since I'm, you knew me. That I'll say cancer patient who is like six months of chemo or whatever, somebody that has zero strength. They feel like they're at death's door. What can we get from that person? And can we uh, get them to the point that they can defend themselves against a person that's bigger, stronger, more athletic than them? And the answer is yes. We can do it. Because I've proven these people won't know it, Roger will know it, but not to the degree that even, that I know it, that I've proven to myself at least that you can use basically zero or, or right above zero as long as it is perfect. Your technique has to be perfect, timing perfect, application all perfect. And you can use just above zero and still uh, survive the attacks of untrained opponents pretty much indefinitely just with how you position your body, the angles that you're at, the distance that you control, filling space, um, covering your head properly. Like all these things lead to a person being tired. And all you need to do is to get them to the point they're more tired than you are weak, and you win. Yeah, it's easy to, to 
sweep and submit and control a exhausted opponent? Very easy. Even if they're skilled, that's that's another piece of the sport. Like it becoming advanced in jujitsu in our martial art is that it's a lot more based on timing than it is technique or um, a- application. That if you do the, the technique 50% right, but at the 100% pinpoint right time, then it's probably going to work. So your timing needs to be worked on before your technique is really worked on. And you won't know that as a student, even if you were, if you've never been told that, maybe I've never even said that to you, Roger, that I, you probably know it, but I haven't said it to you, that I, whenever I was doing those lessons with you, was always most considered about the timing of the technique more just a little bit more than the perfection of the technique and that nobody says that nobody talks about that ever really in jujitsu they mention timing but nobody says man your your timing has to be perfect today and if it is don't worry about your technique you can do it like half right you'll still be fine nobody's ever said that or, or anything close to that have they said that to you? No. No. Does it? It does it stand to reason though? If you use a technique pretty well, but exactly at the right time, it's going to have the best outcome for you. Because if you do it a hundred percent right at the wrong time, it's never going to work. No, that's true. So if you think about it, the, the timing is the most important aspect of every technique. Triangle choke. If you're able to land that, your legs around their arm and their neck at the right time, let's say that their arm is already across and you can fully lock the triangle just in one, like you just do the motion and your triangle's locked and their arm is across. Well, if your arm lock or if your triangle was still just a little off, it's poor. But you're at this point right here. Unless the person's a far superior to you, I bet you you're going to be able to reach up there and cinch it up, pull down on their head, and you'll win because you did it at the exact right time. What do you think about that? Yeah, if you do it at the right exact right time, you're supposed to. It's going to work. Yeah. So that tells you a lot of times the most effective person is the one with the best timing combined with the best technique. But if it's like one person's good technique, the other person's or one person is a good technique, bad timing. The other person is a decent technique, great timing. That person's going to crush the other guy. Well, especially if it's, you know, defending a, like an unfamiliar move. Like like when I came to San Antonio, I started training at 10 Planet, you know, to to uh, really just like stay in shape. But I was curious about like leg locks. And yeah. I got, uh, and I've, we, I mentioned this a few times, but I got, I got, uh, caught in a heel hook um, by this young kid you know early 20s and then after the roll I'm talking to him and he, and I was like how long have you been training and he's like oh about a month Yeah. because I didn't know how to defend so my technique to recognize these entries and then defend once the, the submission was sunk in was novice or non-existent really and then that's what happened he happened to have been like drilling most of the time he was there for that month yeah so if you're if you're totally unfamiliar what's the difference between that and a white belt 
Do you know who showed me the heel hook first, though? The first person to show me what a heel hook was? Who? Susie. Was it really? Yeah, because I was talking to her about it, and because uh, I didn't know what it was. I think I think we had talked about it, but I fully didn't understand it because I'd never been yeah. put in it. Yeah. And we were at work, uh, so up in those the offices that uh, that you had visited before. Yeah. Up in my office at the time, and because uh, our offices were right next to each other, and uh, she's like, "Okay, let me show you real quick." <laughs> and so she put me in a hill look, and she was explaining to me like if you put pressure on it that it would um, damage the knee. Boy, if she taught me something. I would listen so carefully. I, you know. She's the real deal. She's 100%. We've said that back and forth a bunch of times off the air. But everybody doesn't, like, just click. Like, we're friends. Um, You know, like, just fast friends. Everybody's not like that in class. And I, I don't think it's rude to say that I'm not super close to Susie. But we do roll our or whenever I was there regularly and I'll be back but whenever I was there before we rolled all the time and jujitsu compadres or like people that are mat buddies are while we're rolling and training and all that it's like these are good training partners I like them I like it when they're here they make me better I can make them better and you're all good with me. And then, really, you know, we don't really cross paths again before or after class and whatnot. So that, and, you know, other people have other friends, and they, um, that's fine. But her technique and her jiu-jitsu and everything, like fighting knowledge, um, Gracie jiu-jitsu, sport jiu-jitsu, Everything was like as good as I've ever seen a girl do jujitsu. Man, she wore I, Sophia out. Sophia rolled with her, and she was like, she fucked me up. <laughs> she was like exhausted, and I've and I've never rolled with Susie. Uh, I, but I have a chance. I did, you know, roll with her her husband a couple times, and I have never been so tired. Like. Mm-hmm. I was so exhausted towards the end of the roll. Like, I, like, oh, man, like, uh, I just wanted it to be over. Like, I was, like, and, like, I pretty much, like, I was, like, I was pretty much done at the end of the roll. Was like, he, and he was, like, come on, come on. Like, keep yeah. defending. And I was just, like, I was, like, I am done. <laughs> it, it, he uh, smashed me up good. He is legit as he can possibly be. And I know more than most people on the planet, other than Susie and a few others, what it's like to be smashed by Brandon and what it's like to be exhausted and somebody that's like uh, watching my energy, you know what I mean? So I know I've been exhausted many times by him very cleverly in different ways. And he's like got all these different methods that he can like he can be a leg locker and just fully do those techniques like tenth planet and all that kind of stuff. He can be that way. He can be a wrestler and just control and smash. He can pass the guard, mount control, arm lock. He can defend his face. He's on, get on the inside, manage the clinch, get the, like, he can do all that stuff to the, the top level that it's possible. Very sharp, very good, excellent energy, nice guy. Nice dude. guy, yeah. All, but also very nice guy, but also very, if he's, like, in his mind, he's, like, you're messed up probably the type of guy that would say hey you, you're messed up and you need to stop doing that and then get back to whatever it is that he's doing not in a rude way but just if he thinks it he's somebody that will say it 
and I was experienced that many times. I haven't spent a ton of time with him. I uh, I I've only seen him like maybe, you know, three four times. You know, uh, just at uh, just at his uh, where they used to train uh, at uh, Machado's yep. gym, and then yep. uh, of course at Scott's. Well, I've had the the good pleasure of training with him and rolling with him probably like a hundred times or so, and. It was all the same. With me, he would use the same strategy, and it was closeness, tightness, heavy, pressure, like per, uh, technical perfection from technique to technique to technique seamlessly to exhaust. He, he liked to make me tired, and I think I like to make people tired. That's my thing, too. So... I get it. I, I like that, that he's just an advanced jujitsu guy that, what else can you say? He's good technique. Everything is good, and it all works exactly like it's supposed to, and that's how it worked on me, and that's why Susie's so good. We've had some epic wars. Like, I've had wars with Susie for, like, I mean, I've probably rolled with her, like, 30 times, 20 or, 20 or 30 times. That's awesome easily and I can tell you a secret that I I figured out on her what I couldn't figure out on Brandon which is how is she making you so tired how did she make Sophia so tired do you know I, I can tell you what she does is she establishes the top now that's easier said than done but Susie has a, her one gift is getting on top of the fight. And once she's on top, then she does these few things that are, that are very exhausting. And it's stuff that I started to do a little bit. Like I would try it with Scott or I would try it with somebody that is technically better and see, can I make them a little bit more tired? Let me see if it works for me. So, and what she does is, from the top, a lot of times either half guard, um, even guard, but definitely side control and mount. She's not just, she's not just getting there and maintaining control or just holding the position. She'll get into a position of control and then lock her or clasp her hands connect her hands and then use her head to drive her weight into your chest and under your chin so that your body is being driven into the ground hard forward and your your natural inclination is to kind of push back a little bit just to get that pressure off and you activating any muscle at all to push back, it starts the clock of exhaustion. So I, I finally came to the conclusion that if you're being driven like somebody is so heavy forward like that, of course there are other techniques. She at this time was already clever enough to not fall for, the, for those tricks. So the pressure's coming, you just gotta figure it out. So I figured out if I'm not dying from that pressure and I can breathe and nothing is really happening except you're you're miserable for a few minutes maybe a minute a minute and a half two minutes you're miserable but you're not exhausting you're not dying you're just being held down and then made miserable so if you can survive just that pressure and level of forward I mean it's attack really because if you don't defend or hold the position she's pushing and controlling and then she'll just boom progress and then push and control from there then all of a sudden all that forward pressure is like at an angle now so I'm pushing it with a different muscle or like you know like trying to relieve the pressure 
with a different angle that causes a muscle to flex. So you're just being made tired the whole time steadily. Muscles are made to flex the whole time. And then like a minute and a half, two minutes, two and a half, three minutes, then she starts to open up a little bit. There's still pressure, but then she's like knee, knee cut, boom. Then knee on belly, boom. Then she's just waiting, holding, pressure, pressure, then mount, pressure, pressure. So it's just exhaustion, 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 waiting for you to be tired. You get a little bit tired, and she progresses. What about, what about getting her on her heels? Like, what about, uh, you know, being on the offensive and making her defend? How's her, def- how's her defense? Well, the thing is, and I saw, I've seen her hold down plenty of big guys that were skilled, like proper big guys, like almost 300-pound guys that were skilled in jiu-jitsu. So it, it's it's technique, a hundred percent. She um, is so heavy and so controlling that your only option is to relieve whatever pressure that you can, or wait to be released. Because no matter how hard you struggle you're being controlled too effectively. So that thought right there, what about this? You would try that and you would get 60% of the way there and then boom, she's back pushing, controlling pressure. So it's it's that effective attack of hers or uh, control that it's not just chill and control. It's like full-on create exhaustion, and it is very effective. I've tried different things. Like, I mean, I've, I've tried everything in the book. A lot of times I would end up with um, the lockdown from the half guard, and, and that would keep her stuck there briefly but she would continue that pressure and control. So I eventually started to like try to tee our bodies up where she was not straight, like parallel with me. If I had, you know what I mean by the lockdown? Yeah. Of course. So if I had the lockdown, I would try my best to get over there under her other leg, like get an underhook on that leg so no more pressure if the weight is kind of off the ground. Yeah, her balance is off. She's thinking about sweep. Exactly. So I would try my best to deal with that to create a balance issue rather than a pressure issue. And that worked for me, you know, on occasion. I might get a sweep or might end up um, on her back or get it in uh, a good position and maybe the round ends and that would be my only victory with Susie she's so good so but I mean I would show I would try every choke imaginable from the back and I never choked her from the back I never um I swept her like I did th- things worked but her, her, the things that she does well, she does like so incredibly well that it's amongst probably like the three best jujitsu people that I have trained with. Not the best jujitsu people that have taught me or whatever, but uh, I'm not including them, just regular training partners. Right. Like she's she's the top three most difficult struggle, like impossible, frustrating. I see Susie come in the door and I'm like, oh boy, (laughs) maybe she's not going to choose me today. I, of we we got to leave that in. We got to leave that part. We'll cut the other part out, but we got to leave that in. 
and and uh, we're not going to give away. Obviously, we're not going to give away the training partner's secrets, so she can continue smashing everybody to, to pieces. And I'll tell you what, she's going to keep smashing them, even if we put that stuff out. She's going to smash you. Yeah, it wouldn't matter. If you, whoever's listening, you go down there and you ask to roll with her, and I promise you. Unless you're Gordon Ryan listening to this, and Gordon Ryan, you better be uh, cautious because she's good. I'm, I'm, of course, he's like the best of the sport guys, but I have uh, like really, like really incredible faith in her ability, her her jujitsu ability to get things done. Oh As yeah, put Gordon in the gi. Hey. That would be a. She would put up way more, like incredibly more of a match than people would ever imagine. I bet you she would last the whole time. She's that good. And and, and he is he is good in the gi too. Like like those guys like Craig Jones, they're good in the gi. Like 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 they they mostly train no gi, but those guys are still really good in the gi. Oh, of course, of course. Um, oh, dang, ouch. You know, sometimes you get cramps. You ever get a cramp in your, I think I've asked you this before, your calf, calf muscle. It's just like, feels like your calf is going to try to rip off your body or something like that. Man, you need, uh, you need some potassium. Yeah. You're dehydrated yep. too, probably. Probably. Are you drinking up water? Uh, yeah, I drink a lot of water. But I, I think I was just at a, doing a weird angle right there, put, put weight in a weird spot, and it just, the the muscle was at an unfamiliar angle as it flexed, which caused it to, you know, whatever happened, that's probably why. The worst um, is when you get a, 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 like a calf cramp in the middle of the roll. Oh man, I have a video on my, on the channel with me and rolling with Gary and I think it's the it's two parts. I think it's the first part. But either way, you should watch it as a listener or, or you, Roger, if you haven't already. Um, Is it on the channel right now? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely there. It's a two-part video. Did you just put it on there? No, 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 no. It's an older... No way. Is it, isn't it on there? It might be on Facebook only, man. You might, I, don't, I, don't think I, I don't think you have one on the channel channel. Um, let me see. Um, two other things I was going to say about uh, Susie and that whole thing that, like, put the whole thing into perspective. That is just really unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Um, What's it titled? Purple Belt versus Blue Belt BJJ Wolfpack MMA. Oh, part one and two. Yeah. You see it? Yeah, yeah. I, and I remember it, too. I remember these videos, too. That's funny. I I forgot they were on there. Well, good. Yeah, you you can see at one point, I I think it's the uh, modified mount or like I'm stepping over his head for a, one of the nth arm lock variations. And you can tell that that's what happens. Plus, I say, I, I got a cramp. And of course, Gary's a good guy and defensive roller, so he's not gonna roll out of there while I'm having a little mini spasm. So he just kind of chilled out for a second, and I kind of kicked it loose, and then went right back to the position, and we just kept rolling. Hey, man, I'm gonna use whatever advantage I can to tap you, man. If you get a cramp, I'm just gonna take advantage of that. We know those. <laughs> we know for sure. So. They are out there, and you you might be one of them. Not you. You're definitely not one of them. Our listeners might be one of them. Um, although Roger, you will, you have been known to, to just beat the, the living hell out of people, including me. But uh, not in a way that is disrespectful or uh, you know like like what is what is your problem, Roger? Something like that. No, just like fair. Uh, technical I got a lot of energy and you're about to get your butt kicked go 
Yeah. Come on. That, that's fair. That's if it's if it's just as fair to say everybody's going to tap me out today, or just as fair to say I care about defense the most. Then you better be allowing and and ready for somebody like you who who also thinks that, but will will put it to the test. Will get after it, and if you if you don't have that, if you're not rolling with somebody like that's really trying to kill your ass, trying to go at you hard, then they either either they are. Um, taking it easy on you for some reason that's not helping you just to 100% take it easy on you or they think that they're so much better than you that they just don't need to worry with that so um, the white belts that come right in the door they go completely hard some of them completely hard and try to win big time but that's not the same thing. They're not doing the same thing that you would be if you attacked me full on and went for the kill 100%. It would be two separate things. Like you, you wouldn't be grabbing my pants or something like that and then getting handfuls of skin and like I'm not going to let go I'm just going to grab and then move your legs and if they don't come with me then your skin's coming one way or another you know what I mean like, so it's controlled it's controlled uh, bursts of energy yeah and if I said if I was like like ow or, or, or hang on a second then you would immediately stop and be like what what happened like in, instantly at the first sign of I don't want to be doing this right now for whatever reason, then you would stop. So um, white belt is really just kind of operating in life or death mode, whereas you're not in life or death mode whatsoever. And that makes it way harder. So um, those crazy white belts that you were too, right? You were just that, that crazy white belt became uh, an effective purple belt but that crazy white belt is still in there you know what I mean you can still challenge that insane go kill dominate all that same stuff except channel it through the technique where you don't waste energy you you know like all the good stuff it's just it's it's a very difficult puzzle to solve um, one way or another but this is the point I was going to make a, a little a few minutes ago and then maybe we can call this episode a, a wrap so I was saying Susie is like in my opinion world class jiu jitsu um, prowess like her skill level is there so when she rolls with Brandon although they give and take Brandon is able to to catch her just as he would most other people like you know like five if he if he really wanted to maybe four or five times in a row two or three let's say to be to be fair because she's really good but you know consistently tap 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 no pressure, no exhausting him. He's like got the complete playbook playbook on her. So he's really good, super, super good, like we said. So, and I've told you this before, but Professor Scott, I don't know if this is talking out of school to be talking about this, but, and Professor Scott wouldn't say it, nor would Brandon talk about it. But I think it's a third party that I can, especially wanting to tell the truth and tell people how good these people are, that um, Professor Scott would pull Brandon off the wall, just like me, and he would roll with him. And when Brandon rolled with Professor Scott, 
Scott would catch Brandon like Brandon would catch me or Susie. Like tap, 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 control, sweep. Like perfect application and never in a spot where it's um, give and take. It's just Scott, you know, like takedown. Um, whatever the whatever the position is, I, I can remember every I can remember a technique from every position that I saw Scott use a technique and then like change the position or go right into a submission or perfectly transition from a from a collar grip to a takedown or he like he um, fakes for a takedown and then he's standing and he's back down in a takedown so it's like all these confusing um, it's just the highest level jujitsu confusion and trickery and mastery and that's what Scott is so we've got Susie world class if you go roll with her you're going to get your butt kicked no matter probably no matter how good you are two her husband Brandon is able to defeat her regularly he's that good and then three the professor of the academy is able to tap him regularly he's that good so we got world class and then two levels of world class mastery above that's pretty dang good. And what can I say? I mean, I felt all three. They all feel like death. They all feel like impossible situations to answer, to deal with. But if you don't give yourself an option or a way out, you're like, I'm either going to uh, get tapped or die or, or like, it's going to end one way or another without me just going like, oh, I'm too tired, I give up. It's going to play out fairly. And if you do that in your mind, then you will start to see little opportunities. Like, oh, I see an underhook. That's just a small victory. You know, like I'm not going to have pressure this time. Victory. You normally feel like crap at eight minutes or six minutes. They have long rolls there. But normally, it's like you feel like you had a you were in a car wreck or something. It's unbelievable. It's a it's a heck of a role. Then Brandon feels like if you were um, if you had a refrigerator that was completely full and it was laid down on its side and it didn't have rotten eggs in it, Roger. But only you'll know what that means. But uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's pretty gross. <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, uh, Brandon is like a refrigerator full, or you could say a freezer or whatever, full of stuff, heavy stuff, laid down. And your goal is for the next 20 minutes straight, I want you to pick that thing up and turn it over on its side and then pick it up and turn it over on its side and do this as many times as fast and um, you know repetitious as you can do it so like very strenuous very exhausting and he's also grabbing at every like submission opportunity that appears he's legit trying to go for 10 if 10 submissions appear in the role you're going to get tapped 10 times if you don't full on 100 percent life and death defend like for your life defend so fantastic really high level and like i said scott is scott feels like did you ever play the the um nes mike tyson's punch out yeah. So you know how Mike Tyson in the game is just like you you 
the round starts and he just come out comes out and flashes and you're knocked down and you can't really do anything you, you it's like he's unbeatable he's just a flash and you're done that's what when scott goes to 10 that's what it's like it's just you are done you are fully incapacitated from from uh, freedom bell rings incapacitated and you never re- regain your freedom until he hands it back to you that's a very few people once you start getting you know purple brown getting up there not many people are able to just 100 percent do what they want with you right it's pretty rare right right exactly people beat you people definitely beat the crap out of you but you still feel like little opportunities of uh, that there's some hope there somewhere one day you might get them that they just got your number right now but, but they get you they're better than you sure they're there but it's just a very um, rare for somebody when you know the, the techniques to prevent everything that you want to do, you, you get nothing if he, if he, you know, for six months he gave and take. So he's not like that. Just, he's just killing everybody. No, he was giving me that at that time because that's what I needed to get better. So it, it, it was Mike Tyson, I'm telling you, you've never experienced this type of control and progression unless you maybe rolled with Hickson or or uh, well you've rolled a little bit with Helson so you felt that kind of strange technique monkey power man every time you tell that story about me and Helson um, doing that positional it wasn't even a roll really it was more like Hey, I got you in full lockdown. Try to get out of it. Like, try. I forgot what he said, but he's like basically, like, really, really try to get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but, but every time you tell the story, though, you're like, at first it was like, because in reality, I, I got, you know, I got some normal bruises as you would if you rolled. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, normal, yeah. like, you know, because your gi rubs and, and he's holding on tight. So I had a few bruises, like, on my back and stuff. But, like, the first time you told it, you're like, yeah, didn't you have a few bruises and, and uh, you are a little banged up and you were tired? And I'm like, yeah. And the next time he told her, it was like, man, you were bruised all over. <laughs> you were, like, like super banged up and you are exhausted. And then the third time, you are like, you were bruised head to toe. <laughs> Every time you tell it, it gets a little more outrageous. So <laughs> next time you tell it, I'm going to be in a full body cast. It also just killed you. <laughs> But here, here's why, though. Here's why I say that. You you told me that where his grips were and where he was holding, that that area was bruised in all of those spots. Yeah. So it was the way that he his control was that solid and that tight. It was super effective. And, and I was standing right there, and I know that yeah, no, it wasn't like, okay, we're going to roll. Not like that at all. He, it was just him doing that lockdown and you saying, I'm, I'm not basically, is this it? Am I, am, so I'm stuck. And he's like, yeah, try. Try to get out. Let's see. And for 30 seconds or so, you do try 100% and fail to get out of there. But at the end... At some some angle happened that you were able to wind up on top. I was Sweet. able to do that one technique, and he what and he could have pivoted to many other positions and countered it, but he was like, "I'm going to hold this position and then see you do whatever you can. And I'm gonna not I'm not gonna adjust." Yes, so that was the caveat. Would yeah. this move have worked if he would have uh, gone to another? position if he would have changed from that to a different hold or even progressed you know no 
but I was able to do the one where you put your elbow in there, uh, maybe right above their hip or on their hip and belly area, and you lift your hips and turn, and you kind of kind of lift them on top of you, and you end up in you end up rotating, and you're there on the bottom now, and you're on in side control. And one thing that I noticed is when you you hit it right on the head there with that explanation that it was about Helson was doing this to test holding you down with that control. And anything other than that wasn't being addressed. So when he did start to lose it, then I could see that he was like, okay, you know, like I lost it. That's it. But then so, he immediately was recovering guard, like, halfway in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. It's, that's just technique coming, you know, like, just being channeled through Helson, that he it's outside of his control. That He's just using the technique um, reflexively outside of his control because that's his nature. It's automatic. Yeah, automatic. But what I was going to say is, there's an arm lock opportunity there that I'm sure Helson would have thought about. There's a choke opportunity there because there's a, a reaching um, potential with both hands. And anytime both hands are able to be put in the collar deep and one of yours is being used for something else, then there's a choke potential. And... Um, there is an attack from the bottom that Helson does from that exact position with the gi. So there were a couple of different attacks that he would have probably transitioned to if he had been like, this is a life and death fight. Oh, so, yeah. Could you imagine if, if Helson uh, wanted to kill you? It, it's terrifying to think about. You're dead my friend you are gonna die if Helson wanted to kill you he will kill you I think he's the type that, uh, maybe we should cut this out <laughs> but, you can you can pick up your balls in the mailbox <laughs> yeah he's the type of guy that if he got to the point where he's like I'm gonna kill that guy that that guy's probably gonna die cause Helson is a very uh, he's a serious man Although he's very playful and he's kinda, hilarious, he's a he knows what he's doing though. He is teaching jujitsu the Elio Gracie way, so he's playful and you know, like he's keeping everybody engaged. And he does a very good job. He's like a fantastic teacher, of course. But um, yeah, if he's not doing that. Like playing that, I don't want to say playing that role, but you know, teaching jujitsu the proper way. If he's not doing that, Helson's a very serious. Like you, you're not gonna walk up and be like, "Hey, old man, what's up?" Elbow him, something like that. Any kind of disrespect like that, you better walk up there with with your um, testicles like covered. Because Helson's about to bang, bash you in to the degree that that might be the only spot that you need to protect, because everything else is going to be broken and and bashed in, and you at least want to be able to maybe have a kid one day. So covering your face and your arms and, and whatnot like that is going to be ineffective if Helson wants to hurt you or, or bust you up. You're going to get it either way. So just cover the most important thing to you and take take the beating that you evidently that you uh, paid for. If you're fighting else, and then you dang well deserve it for some reason. You've done some stupid crap. So I don't know if we can use any of that, especially to protect your nuts from Helson. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. No, you wouldn't have to fight dirty. 
No. He could, he could destroy you in any way he wanted. Right this second. Kelsey's probably, he's probably asleep right now. But if you walked in that man's room and just, you were just like, Kelsey, fight! <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know that. He would jump up like that Terry Silver uh, in Karate Kid 3. Just, Hasaya! You know, like just ready to freaking fight. Right. Drop, drop, drop in the hat. He's full on sleeping. Fight. And he just goes. Fighting machine. Well, uh, are you ready to wrap this thing up? Yeah, man, I think so. I didn't even see, oh, 1230. Good grief. <laughs>